All successful people are excellent communicators. So how do you communicate more effectively with others? Now the first one is a profound communication principle. And the first agreement is saying what you mean and mean what you say. Words have the power to create or destroy. And a careless comment could alter a relationship forever. So it's a good idea to choose your words carefully and consider their impact before you put them out there in the world. So before you speak or write, I want you to ask yourself these four questions. Is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? And is it helpful? If you don't get yeses to those questions, then don't say it. One of the things I observe is simply this. A lot of people are very careless with their language. I mean, the words you use either lift up your energy, the words you use either make you more creative, or the words you use deny your talents. Think about the great dictator. They're words of hatred. They're words of toxicity. Their words of breakdown cause the people around them to do sometimes incredibly terrifying acts. Then you look at people like a Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King Jr. or Mother Teresa. You look at the great business builders. You look at humanitarians. You look at a lot of the great artists. And they were so careful with their words. And their words lifted people. And that's really what great leaders do. They use the language of leadership. I see this everywhere. Someone very close to me who was a little sloppy with her languaging said, Oh, I forgot to do this. It's not on my to-do list. I should punch myself in the face. If you say that every day, what's that doing to your self-esteem? You say that over a lifetime, what's that doing to your self-identity? And as you know, your income is a function of your self-identity. And your performance is a reflection of your personal story. And the way you build your self-architecture and the way you see yourself in the world is in part through your words. You're never going to rise any higher in terms of your impact in the world than the way you see yourself. If you see yourself as average, well, you're not going to read the books, go to the events, do the study, put in the training time, find the mentors, do the work to rise to world class because you're running an interior psychological story that says you're average and the eight players are somehow different from you. If deep down inside you're coming from scarcity and you think, you know what, I'll never have more than the salary that I'm making because of the story that you have through the words you've used, well then you're not going to go out there and ask for the big order. You're not going to go start the big business. You're not going to read the books on financial mastery because Deep inside, you would say, what would be the point? I'm not one of those people. And if you want to rewire your self-identity, so you go out in the world and you're literally operating at legendary, then you absolutely must dial into this first point of what legendary leaders do in terms of the way they speak, which is get your precision of languaging right. Because like I say, the great leaders how did they transform humanity? It was through their words. How did the great military generals get their armies to go out there on fire? It was through their words. So calibrate your languaging, sir. Your words to yourself are world class. And also the words you use to your team, to your customers, to your loved ones. So incredibly important. If and this leads me to the next communication skill that's probably the most critical skill for everyone on the planet to master. And that is the skill of effective listening. Now the undeniable truth is that so many of us are terrible listeners. And there can never be effective communication without both parties being as focused on the listening part as they are on the speaking part. Because if you aren't really listening and responding to what the other person is actually saying, ultimately all you're really doing is having a conversation with yourself. Now here's an invaluable tip. Whenever you're having an important conversation, it could be with your spouse or your partner, with a child, with an employer, a customer, or someone on the other side of the political divide, let them go first. Don't interrupt them and argue with them. Let them empty themselves out first. Remember this. You can't pour water into a full glass. You have to let the water out before you can have more put in. Instead, really listen to their point of view. Be curious. How is it that they've come to feel this way, to have this point of view? What is it that they're needing you to hear? Now this takes a commitment to really want to know what the other person is experiencing and needing. 
Sometimes when you've done your best to listen closely to someone, you may not have heard exactly what it was they were trying to say. And that's why it's so important for you to double check and make sure you've really understood them correctly. And the easiest way to do that is before you speak to say, so what I'm hearing you say is, and then repeat back to them what you think they were saying, what they meant to say. And then give them the opportunity to clarify any misunderstandings that you might have before you respond to them. So it's always best to make sure you're really responding to what they're really saying. And the more you practice, again, the quality of your performance, it's all about the quality of your practice. And the more you actually practice speaking up when you know you want to speak up, the more you will actually step. When you actually speak up with someone, you tell them how you're feeling, tell them what's most important to you. Well, if it's the right relationship, one that's meant to be in your life, there's professional or personal, that is really a gateway into the other person. If you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized. Because otherwise you're going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. Teach people to be articulate. Because that's the most dangerous thing you can possibly be. You're going to speak effectively. You have to know way more than you're talking about. To do that, you have to do a lot of reading. That's on the input side. And then on the output side, well, there's some tricks. There isn't a thousand people there. There's a thousand individuals. And so you just look at an individual and you say something and you can tell if they're engaged. They look confused or they look interested or they look angry or they look bored. Or, and they, they give you feedback about how you're doing. People that I've watched in my life and spectacularly success are, they have skills, clear, yes, minimum condition. They're also very, very good at articulating. So whenever they negotiate, they're successful. They are quiet, self-contained, not particularly expressive. They're sensitive, people-oriented, and concerned about other people's opinions. If you're communicating, this person requires slow, low-key, easygoing, friendly, almost warm and fuzzy. Now the third type of person is what we call the director, and achieve them with and through other people. They like to talk about achievement. What are you doing? How did you do it? How did it work? Let me tell you what I did and how it worked for me. Many times they become managers or executives because they have highly integrated personalities. They're very concerned about results, but they're also concerned about people. Now, everybody you meet is in one of these four quadrants or groups. The mistake that most people make is that they treat everyone else as if they were just the same as they were. However, no matter which style of communicator you are, three quarters of the people you meet are something else. Now, there's no right or wrong, better or worse style. These are almost born into people. You can see them in children from an early age. However, your job in asking questions and listening to people is to find out which style they are and then to practice personality flexibility so that you can get along with a greater number of different types of people. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day, but somebody's really feeling bad and you offer up a kind word. Maybe it's just a friendly, hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention turn somebody's day around might make them feel more worthwhile. Cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. When you give kindness, not gone, it's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred. Kindness. So important in every aspect of your life. So important in building good relationships with others. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. Hey Mary, how are you today? How are things? She says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it, everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is, unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, talking to someone who really cares. Sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third, and maybe a fourth. Or trust.
and the person finally understands that you do care, then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Learn to ask questions, build and trust the communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity in the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express is a bridge. When you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communications. You'll need the skills that will help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goal. You need effective communication. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, be able to work well with others, be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying. Interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. You've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery for your substance, knowledge, and awareness, and understanding, and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. Best communication occurs when both people are sincere. One sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two in saying it well is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practice. Say it well. Practice. 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 Part of what I teach in sales training is practice. Practice. Start with something simple. And when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. So, practice is not take. And your ability to communicate what you know. People out there who say, no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to the practice while you stumble around. So, be thankful for the no. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillful sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams and the future. Different. Skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. You trade the hammer for an axe, cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. Practice get the skill saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. Now here's another part of saying it well. Brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be. Because you can learn to make words more effective. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style. Variety of style. Then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary, can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up.
Now most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. And only with your present vocabulary can you see. Can't use tools you don't have today. Create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, section, vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Now vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head. Translate our question, translate our answers, our perception, what we see, to be able to say it. And I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Not having the vision, not having the tool. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got. This little narrow world. Making mistakes every day. Why? They can't see. Getting it wrong every day. They can't comprehend. They can't understand. No tools with which to translate. Good communication, number one, is having something good to say. Number two, is saying it well. And number three, is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking. Would you say what you're saying a little softer? Say it a little stronger. Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Did you quit? A lot of the decision-making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read. How well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to read. Doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is, you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting. What they are doing with their hands, their eyes. A guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down and frowning. You've got your work cut out. This guy's not going to be easy to read. The lady standing up from behind her desk. Got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. Probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one. Read what you hear. Got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. Be a good parent. You've got to be a good listener. Talk well. Got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little soft. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's word. Not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals. Feedback of words gives it. Now, here's the third way to read your audience. And that is, read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. Woman says it doesn't feel right. Just doesn't 
feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. She says, it's something. She says, something, something. What is the something? She says, I'm telling you, something doesn't feel right. Now, men can learn it. Women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling. You can adjust your communication. So you can adjust your approach. So you can get your message across. So you can communicate well. Every year, about one and one half percent of the population starts work for the first time. They take their first job as adults. And so it's like a big marathon. It's a big race. And everyone lines up. Then the gun goes off. Bang! And everybody starts to run. Then, just like a marathon, some people get way ahead in this case in the earnings race. The great majority stay in the middle. And some people fall well behind. So they just finished a 25-year study, which I think is one of the great studies on success that's ever been done. They ask, how is it that these people can be earning so much money in a paycheck? They're receiving a pay of almost a million dollars a month for going to work, and if they lost their job for any reason, another company would hire them immediately and pay them $10 million a year. How can this happen? So these researchers at a major university went back and they said, well, these people must be very intelligent. They must have special gifts. They must have set special qualities or talents that could enable them to be so successful in life. So they went back and looked at their school records and the records at their first job and their second job. You know what they found? These people were just average even when they started off their work life. They didn't look any different from anyone else. They were just average. But then, they all started to practice a single strategy, and this is the strategy that... And this is the strategy that will change your life and your career forever. It's so simple, you can't believe it. When these people took their first job, the first thing they would do is they would go to their boss and say, Boss, I want to make a valuable contribution in this work, and I want to be successful in this company. What one skill would help me the most to be more successful and make a more valuable contribution? <clears throat> And the boss would say, well, if you are very good at negotiating, team building, selling, or reading financial statements, if you were really good at this, then you would be much more valuable than an average person. So they would say, okay, and they would write down the development of that skill as a goal, just like a lesson plan for a subject in school. They would go to work, and they would work on this one skill, like a sniper rather than a machine gunner. They would work on a single skill, and it might take them a month. Then it might take them a month, and it might take them three months, and it might take them a year, but they would work every day on that skill. And here's the magic number. Two hours per day. Five days per week. Ten hours in all. Two hours per day of personal study, a single skill. Five days per week. Knowledge and skill today are vital to your success. Knowledge and skill equal earning ability. Your knowledge and your ability to apply that vital knowledge to accomplishing a result for which customers are willing to pay, it's critical. People who get laid off don't understand that they have not kept their knowledge and skill high enough to justify their earnings, but they are becoming obsolete faster than ever before. I think that means that a job today can become obsolete in a week, a month, a year. New technology can obsolete an entire industry in a couple of years. So one of the questions you need to ask yourself all the time is this. What is your next career going to be? And here's the quick question. What do you have to do now to bring your skills up to the point so that you can earn the kind of living and have the kind of lifestyle that you want in your next career? The key to your next career is personal excellence. It's to get to the top of the heap where you are now. Get to the top of the field and then stay at the top of the field to maintain and improve your lifestyle. What do you have to do? What do you have to be? Here's a good question. It's one of my favorites of all questions. Ask yourself what one skill or set of skills could you develop that, if you became absolutely excellent at, would have the greatest positive impact on your future? Point skill, or what one set of skills, if you could develop them and become absolutely excellent at them, would have the greatest positive impact on your future. 
Your job is to define that. Ask your boss what it might be if necessary. Do everything possible to find out and then develop those skills. Now, if you do not become a master of change, then you have no choice but to become a victim of change. If you don't become a master of circumstances, you become a creature of circumstances. You simply are buffeted about on seas of life. Throughout everything that we've talked about with regard to earning ability, with regard to fast, tracking your career, with regard to you fulfilling your potential and becoming everything that you're capable of becoming. The critical point is continuous learning. I cannot tell you how important this is. I meet people all over the world who come to America and come here with nothing. And as a result of continuous learning, they're able to accomplish wonderful things and make great lives for themselves. So take charge of your life. See yourself as the president of your own company. See yourself as a leader. Set the standard in your world. Set the standard in your world. Set the standard for your children if you want your children to have a great life. You create a great life by dedicating yourself to continuous learning as well. See yourself as a role model, as all leaders do. Set high standards for yourself and work every single day to maintain and increase and improve your earning ability. So there are 168 hours in a week. Everywhere now what we're saying is that if you want to go to the top of your field and be one of the highest paid and most successful people in life, take 10 of those hours and invest them in yourself, that's all. And this turned out to be the strategy practiced by all the top people. I have worked with the presidents of some of the biggest companies in the world, and they spent two to three hours each week reading and upgrading their skills. Do you know who the third richest man in the world is? It's a man named Warren Buffett. Last year, his total investments are worth $350 billion, the third or fourth largest single company in the United States, one of the biggest companies in the world. Last year, his profits were $25 billion. By the way, $25 billion is good. That's a good amount for one person to grow a company that generates $25 billion in profits. Warren Buffett has the same schedule almost every day. What he does is he comes to work and he spends 80% of his time studying and reading in the subjects relative to his business. Only 20% is in meetings or phone calls or anything else. He spends 80% of his time learning new things so he can make better decisions and get better results. So, a question I sometimes ask adult is how many hours a week do you spend studying new subjects to help increase your productivity and your value? So, they found that these experts these highly paid people looked upon earning ability like a ladder. A ladder has steps, and each step is a skill. When you learn a new skill, you increase your earning ability. Also, you increase your ability to use your other skills, and each time you learn a new skill, your earning ability goes up. When you learn a new skill, your earning ability goes up, and each new skill you learn causes you to become more and more valuable, and people will pay you more and more money for the results that you can get for them. Now, if at any given time you decide to stop climbing the ladder of success, you will level off like most people do. But then you will begin to decline because whatever skills you have are becoming obsolete at a rapid rate. And they're becoming obsolete faster today than ever before. So if you are not constantly moving up the ladder, you're actually moving down the ladder. And people don't understand why their income is not going up. It's because they're not becoming more productive. They are not learning new skills. They're not working on themselves to become more successful. So, increasing your earning ability is the strategy used by the highest paid people in the world today. Every week, they spend 10 hours or more studying a new skill. The one skill that can help them the most. They keep climbing that ladder and it just becomes a habit. Part of their life, just like a part of your life, maybe watching television or playing sports or something else. A part of their life is learning all the time. It's your ability to focus single-mindedly on one thing at a time and to work on that one task until it's complete and to discipline yourself not to do anything else or become distracted by emails and bells and beeps and noises and things like that. It's just the ability to focus like a laser beam on a single task. Napoleon Hill did a subsequent book to his book, They Can Grow Rich. It was called The Master Key to Riches.
And after 260 pages, he gives you the answer. The master key to riches. So in the first paragraph, he explains, in this book, you will learn the master key to riches. The most successful people have come to that conclusion as well, that self-discipline is the master key to success. A friend of mine wrote a best-selling book a couple of years ago, and basically what it said is whatever got you to where you are today is not enough to keep you there today. To go any further, you must develop new skills. And how long does this go on? All your life. For the rest of your life. When you are surrounded by rapid changes in information and technology and competition and government policies, as long as there is rapid change going on outside of you, there must be rapid change and even faster change going on inside of you if you want to be successful. So the top people are the ones who keep learning new skills all the time. They say, everything is hard before it's easy and everything at the beginning is difficult but later becomes easy and automatic. You have to force yourself to discipline yourself at the beginning, but after that it becomes easier and easier, and you actually feel happy. Now, here's the most wonderful thing. When you discipline yourself to start and complete a task or a part of a task, you feel like an athlete. So here's my question. If an athlete runs in a race and comes in first, what do they call this person? The winner. Exactly, I've studied this hundreds, thousands of hours. What it says is that when you win, when you come in as the winner, your body releases endorphins, which are called nature's happy drug. They make you happy and dopamine, which is a form of energy that you get from a positive experience. So when you complete a task, your body releases these drugs and you feel happy. So they call it nature. The psychologists call it nature's happy drug. If you want to be happy, just start and complete a task and you get a zip. Well, wow, you feel happy. In fact, in some of my seminars, I say, here's a question for you. What are you learning today? Right? In other words, what is the subject that you are working on today? And what you should do is, you should ask people at the break, what is your subject today? What is your subject today? What are you working on? What are you learning about today?